I'm Skye. Today I'm going to talk to you about zooarchaeology and give you a tour of the zooarchaeology laboratory here at the University of Maine. So I am a zooarchaeologist, which means that I study animal remains from archaeological sites. Humans have always interacted with other animals, and the results of those interactions often end up in archaeological sites. We hunt other animals, we eat them, and we make things out of their body. And the remains of all those activities are what I study. Animal remains in archaeological sites usually take the form of bones. Bones last well, much longer than other parts of animals, and they're easy to find in archaeological sites. The bones on the left in this picture are large and relatively complete. These would be easy to identify, but the reality is that most bone that we find archaeologically looks more like this. These bones are broken up and usually burned. These bones are hard to identify. Bones that have been modified into tools are also hard to identify, especially when they've been broken into small pieces that don't have very distinguishing marks on them, or like this, when they've been modified to the point that there is no distinguishing marks left. Animal remains can be things other than just bone too. This piece of pottery has residue on it from cooking, and that residue can contain evidence of kinds of animals that were cooked in that pot. This stone tool on the bottom was used to scrape hair and flesh off of hides, and that residue can also remain on the stone tool. So both of these give us opportunities to study other types of animal remains in archaeological sites to see how people were interacting with animals. So what kinds of questions can we answer with animal remains? The most obvious question is, what did people eat? People have always eaten other animals. And while some of us choose not to do so now, we have a long history of eating other animals. Here you can see a picture of a hearth. An animal bone in a hearth or a cooking pit is a pretty good indication that it, that animal got eaten. But the most direct indication that an animal got eaten is poop. When an animal bone is found in poop, that is direct evidence that that animal was eaten. For example, this bone was found in poop in a cave in Texas. And this bone, believe it or not, is from a dog. Another question that we can answer is how did people get and prepare the food that they ate? The size of a fish and the way a fish behaves can tell us a lot about how people fished and where they fished. For example, little fish like this one are frequently um, schooling fish that swim together in big schools and they're most easily caught with nets. So if we find a lot of these in a site, we might be uh, finding evidence that those people use nets. Whereas big fish like swordfish are not easily caught in nets and have to be hunted for in different ways. We also find evidence of how people prepared their food. The marks that are left on bones from butchering can tell us how they cut their food up, the way they thought about animal bodies, and the parts of the animals that they ate. For example, this is a diagram of cut marks on a pig jaw, and they show us that at this time, people were probably eating pig tongues because there are marks here specific to cutting the tongue out of the head. We can also answer questions about when people lived at archaeological sites because people didn't always live in one place year round. They would move from place to place throughout the seasons. So for example, this fish is an alewife and it only runs at a certain time of year. So if we find an archeological site with a lot of alewife in it, we know that people were at that site during the time of year that alewife was running. We also can learn about the environment from the types of things that are in archeological sites. For example, here are some caribou. Caribou are a subarctic species. They like to feed on lichen on rocks and they walk around really well on the snow. So when we find a site that has caribou in it, like a site in Massachusetts 11,000 years ago, we know that that site was actually much colder then than it is today because it had animals like caribou at it. Another way that we can tell what time of year people were at a site is from the ways that bones fuse as an animal gets older. This is an example of what a hand looks like in a child. Children have 
um, separate growth plates on a lot of their bones that by the time they're done growing fuse and the growth actually occurs right between the plate and the rest of the bone. So when you're done growing those bones fuse together. So if we find deer for example and we know that deer give birth to their babies in the spring and we find a deer skeleton that looks like it's about six months old or about a year old then that can tell us that that site was occupied either six months or a year after the spring. We can also answer the question of whether or not some people ate better than other people. Some parts of an animal have more meat, are more nutritious, or are just easier to eat than other parts of an animal. So if you find a habitation site that has a lot of really good cuts of meat at it, you can assume that maybe that person was getting good food for some reason. Maybe they were the hunter, or maybe they were just an important person and people gave them good food. This can tell you a lot about a society. How we share our resources tells us a lot about how we interact with each other. There are a lot of things that can make it harder for us to answer these questions. For example, how bones are disposed of originally and how we go about excavating them archeologically today can both impact our interpretations of a site. If bones are stolen or broken into little pieces by predators, wild or domestic, that can make it harder for us to identify those bones and to understand how people were interacting with the animals those bones came from. Where people throw bones away in a site and where archeologists choose to excavate in a site can both have an impact on what bones we actually recover and get to look at. For example, what if a culture believed that fish should be thrown back into the river when you're done eating them? And so all of the fish bones were thrown back into the river. Then none of them would have made it into the trash heap on the archeological site. And we would think that those people never ate fish. So we have to be careful with our interpretations. Finally, some bones are just hard to recover. Fish bones, for example, are very, very small, especially for smaller fish like alewife. These bones have to be recovered with very special techniques, such as fine screening, where the soil is brought back to the laboratory and actually screened and picked through here. And you'll see that when you, we do our lab tour here in a moment. The first step in analyzing animal bones from an archeological site is to determine what part of the animal the bone came from. Once you've determined what part of the animal you have, then you can move on to trying to decide what animal you are looking at. For example, here is a bone that I showed you earlier. This bone was found in human feces or poop. This is an occipital condyle, which is a portion of the skull right here where the skull articulates or meets up with the vertebra. Once we figured out that this was an occipital condyle, we were able to compare it to all of the different skulls that we have in our lab to try and figure out what kind of animal it came from. Let's take a tour of the lab and see what other kinds of bones I have here. Welcome to the Zooarchaeology Laboratory. That's Bocephus. He's my deer skeleton and he keeps me company in the lab. And I'm gonna use him today to show you where some of the bones are that you have in your body, also on a deer. There's his head or his skull, and you can see his spine coming all the way down the back, all the way to his tail. Here are his hip bones right here with his back legs. This is his femur, and then here is his tibia right there. And then these are his feet. Deer stand on their toes. They're undulates. They have two toes. They stand on their toes. And then this bone here, called the metatarsal, is also known as the cannon bone. This is equivalent to the bones inside your feet. Here's his front legs. This is his humerus, that's your upper arm bone, and his lower front leg with his radius and his ulna. This part that sticks out right here, I'll get a little bit closer so you can see it. See that? If you touch the pointy hard part of your elbow, that's what that bone is, it's your ulna. And then here are his front feet with another cannon bone right here. These are really good for making tools. Here's his scapula as well. This is your shoulder blade. Over here is where I do a lot of my work. I study fish bones. So I sit at a microscope a lot of the day looking at bones that are very, very small. Let's go see some of them. 
here, right here, is some dirt that I have removed bones from. This is a little pile of bones. They're very hard to see because they're very small. This is charcoal. And over here, you can see bones that have been burned and bones that have been burned so much that they're white. Here's the rest of my lab. All of these cabinets are full of skeletons. And these skeletons are what I use to identify the bones that I find archeologically. We compare them to the skeletons of animals that we know what they are. In these drawers right here behind where I sit are lots of fish bones. This is cod. This is what a cod skull looks like. And here are some other fish bones. Right here are flounder. They look very similar from a distance, but the details are different. Let's go look at some other bones. This is where I keep my mammal bones. If we walk in here, we can see some beavers right here. This is where I keep my beavers, if I can get it open. There we go. Here are some beaver bones. These are vertebra. And here are beaver teeth, a beaver femur, and a beaver pelvis. Let's see if we can find a skull. Here we go. Here's a beaver skull. This one doesn't have its teeth in it, but this is what the skull of a beaver looks like. They're bigger than you think. Here's a bottom jaw. This one has its tooth in it. Let's see what else we can find. On this side, I keep moose, deer, and caribou. Moose and deer look very similar except for their size. For example, if we go over here, these are deer bones. This is what's called a cannon bone. I call it a metacarpal. Because deer stand on their toes, these are the bones that would normally be in this part of your hand or in the long part of your foot, right before your toes. In a deer, this is how big the metacarpal is. Let's look at it in a moose. Oh yes, much bigger. See, moose are much bigger than deer. I have lots of skulls, and usually we don't find a whole skull archeologically, we just find pieces. Right here, you can see a moose skull. See, here's where the large antlers would attach. Down here, this is going to be the nose and upper lip of the moose. And this part right here can be really confusing when you find it archeologically. If you find just a piece of it, it looks kind of like a fish hook. Over here, we can see the skulls of some marine mammals. This is a gray seal. Look at those teeth. And this is a harbor seal. They're a little bit smaller. What do you think these are? What do you think? Little teeth, good for catching fish. Great big brain case, very smart. Porpoise, these are porpoise skulls. I have two of them. This is a horse skull. Horses are really interesting because they're basically just chewing machines. They have really big lower jaws, but little teeny tiny brains. Not much room in there for a very big brain. And here is my bear skull. Bears have very similar skeletons to human. So sometimes when a bear skeleton is found, the police are called because it looks so much like a person. Let's look at some. Here are some bones from a bear. This is a femur. Remember the femur is the thigh bone. Oops. And here is a humerus. This is the upper arm bone. Very similar to people. The way an animal uses its body impacts the way that the bones are formed inside the animal. And we use this when we're trying to identify what kind of a bone we have. So for example, this 
is a rabbit femur. And you can see it's very long and thin because rabbits hop, right? What do you think this animal does with its back legs? These are two different animals that use their back legs very similarly. These are both femurs as well. Both of these animals swim. This is a beaver femur, and you can see it's very wide. There's room for a lot of muscle attachments for swimming. This is a seal femur. Even though a seal is much bigger than a beaver, its femur is very short because they have very, very long tibias, the lower part of the leg. The femur on a seal is also wide and flat because it uses it to swim and so that's how the muscles attach and that's how the muscles pull on the bone. This is especially true for teeth. If you think about the teeth of something like a deer, they're used for grinding up plant matter. And if you think about teeth for something like the seal, the seal and the porpoise that we saw earlier they're used for catching and eating fish. So they're very pointy because fish are very slippery. This animal has teeth very similar to ours. These teeth are used to eat a wide variety of things because this animal, like us, is an omnivore. Omnivores are animals that eat plants and animals. This animal is an omnivore too. I can't open his mouth, unfortunately, but he has very similar molars to you and I. This is a bear, and this is a pig. They have very similar teeth to humans. Thank you for joining me in the Zooarchaeology Laboratory for my tour today. I really hope that next year we get to see some of you in person and answer your questions. That really is the best part for us. Thanks.